Today's message is on rest. Uh, so one more time, would you give the Lord a big hand and for our Thomas and his ministry? Good morning! Good morning! I am excited for today. Did you guys manage to get that video to happen? Is it back there? Hey. Okay, don't hit play yet, but uh, I'm just going to set this story up. So I, last, uh, in, in December, I was in Uganda again, and um, we... We were, uh, okay, so some of you, maybe you remember from last year that uh, we've got an orphanage we're building over there. Uh, they've been using it as a primary school while we're still in the building process. And it's still not done being built, but we at least now we're housing about uh, 150 kids while we're also educating about 400. So it's been a lot of fun. We're way out in the bush. There's no running water, no electricity. Um, and it's just been this wild, crazy labor of love from a lot of people. Well, uh, the way we do things here in the States is you build something like this building over here, and you got to have all the permits, and you got to have all the inspections, and then once you get your certificate of occupancy, then you can actually let people inside. Over there, the way it works is that the, the, the government's just like, we don't want to busy ourselves with a bunch of people who dream and don't finish. So you build it, start doing it, and then we'll come and certify it. So the mentality is, it doesn't have to be done yet. Let's just make it happen. So, I mean, they go out there. And, and two Decembers ago, I was out there. We were graduating our first uh, uh, class from the primary school, which their school year runs different from ours. That's why graduation was in December. But, um, so I'm over there, and I'm like, boy, these buildings, they look rough. I mean, they're, the buildings they're doing it in, they're, it, they're not even finished. And uh, they invited this, like, district school superintendent lady that she shows up. And, of course, everybody has a turn to talk at the microphone. It's this big, long, six-hour graduation for, you know, 12-year-olds and less. <laughs> it's just bananas. So this lady uh, comes up, the district education secretary, I think it was, something like that. And she says, uh, she just starts ripping apart the project. Just from the microphone, in front of the parents, in front of everybody, and keeps turning to me and saying, and uh, we expect you to, um, to add plaster to the walls. And, to, and I'm just sitting there like, I didn't sign up to have kids at the school yet. I've still got two, three more years on building. But I, I didn't say anything. I just kind of took it. The long story short, here I am now this December, and I'm expecting here it comes again. And I've got a team with me. And uh, this time there's a different district education secretary. And uh, this guy comes in hobbling on this cane like this. And um, he came and sat down right next to me. And I was like, hmm. Now, I didn't know he was the district education secretary at the moment. But when I started greeting him and talking to him, I find out what he does. And I said, what's the story with your leg? And I believe it was, uh, if I remember right, it was nine years ago. It might be in the video. It was nine, 10, 11 years ago. He was in some sort of accident where he was hit by a car. And uh, I think it was a motorcycle accident, if I remember right. But at any rate, he messed up his leg. They wanted to do surgery. He couldn't afford the surgery, but he could afford the cane. And so for all these years, he's been hobbling around like this. I said, you know, I believe Jesus wants to heal you. Can I pray for you? And he laughs, right? I said, no, I'm serious. Like, can I pray for you right now? He goes, okay. And he puts his leg out like this. And uh, I just, I, I, I think the first time I held his hand, and I just said, knee be healed in Jesus' name. I said, move that around. Does that feel any different? He's sitting down in the chair, and he puts his leg out. He goes, ah! And he grabs my hand and puts it on his knee. <laughs> and I said, yeah, be healed in Jesus' name all the way. I go, how's that? And he moves it around again. He rolls up his pant leg, grabs my hand, puts it on his bare knee. <laughs> I'm like, maybe he thought I'd get better reception or something. I don't know. And, uh, and this time he stands up, and he goes, ah, he's good. I said, just, just walk to there and back, and, and let me know how it feels. And he walks to there, and then he just keeps going and <laughs> disappears. And we're like, where'd he go? And his, his cane's laying here on the floor, and we're like, what just happened? Is he, like, trying to get away from the crazy American? What's going on? So we just continue with the, the graduation formalities and all the stuff that's going on. And about 30 minutes later, we've got... Uh, I believe it's 13 acres, somewhere, somewhere between 10 and 13 acres out there. About a half hour later, I see this guy on the other side walking. And um, turns around, turns out he had walked the circle of the entire property. 
And that's where this video kind of picks up. You want to hit play on that? Yeah, so, so what happened? I have an accident. Yeah, no accident. I used that 10 years down the road. 10 I years. Yeah, I was taking it without those people. Yeah, yeah taking it without those people. Go to the specialist, the police. Uh huh. So, dude, they told me, uh, I have to raise uh, 1,700 dollars yeah. to make a new implant. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, in your name. Uh -huh. So, I put a previous money. Yeah. So, they said, you go back and look for the money. And the maybe when you get the money, you come and you put it there. Meanwhile, you can use it on the crutch. That's what this means. So you've been using the crutch. But I'm not using it. What happened today? No, the only thing is that now I'm wondering where the pen has gone. Walk a little. I want to see. Yeah, what? Well, just just walk for me. I want to be. I want to be. I want to be. That's Jesus, man. Jesus. Amen. Bless you. I can see it. Amen. I put it even move around. Yeah. You can see it. Moving from the seat. Yeah. Move from the seat. Yeah. I was moving on the seat. But I moved all the way up to the whole compound. Yeah, you walked all the way around. But I'm moving. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> now, here's the extra fun part. We were having a really hard time fundraising last year. And, uh, and so I was, like, doing everything I could, uh, but, but also kind of not. You know, I wasn't trying really hard to fundraise, but every time I tried, it was like it just didn't produce much. And I was kind of discouraged around, uh, around the time of this trip. And just before we left for this trip, the Holy Spirit was like, why are you trying so hard in your own strength? This isn't about you. He goes, you trust me, I'll take care of it. He goes, this is my orphanage, not yours. And so I just was like, okay, Jesus, I trust you. This guy, the district education secretary, he's basically in charge of, he's the boss of all the school inspectors in the region. After this, he goes to the pastor's house with us for lunch. And he looks at me and he says, I am in charge of all the school inspectors. And he says, if anyone gives you a problem and wants to close down this school before it is finished, tell them to talk to me. I will support you. <laughs> so... So that happens, and then a week after I get home, I, I should say it was a month after I got home. Someone tried a week after I got home, and there was a shuffling and lost in the mail stuff happened, but long story short, a month later, I get a check from somebody that has never really donated to the orphanage before that I can remember, maybe a maybe hundred bucks or something. They gave us $50,000 <laughs> without us even asking them for it. So, yeah, big crazy deal. And it, I mean, all of it goes over there. That's just the way we run our organization. But, I mean, it, it just blew my mind that in the whole year I was striving, we didn't raise barely a fraction of this $50,000 that came all in one big chunk when I stopped trying, when it was all about Jesus. And I realized, you know, the Christian life's a lot like this. You know, sometimes we, Ephesians 2 Verse 8 through 10, it says that you were saved by grace through what? Faith. Faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's a gift from God. It's not by works so no one can boast, right? For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. But what I love, <laughs> Colossians 2 says something here that really makes me happy. Uh, Colossians, Colossians. Yep, same place as last time. All right, Colossians 2, verse 6. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, which was how? By grace through faith. The same way you received him, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. A lot of times we come to Jesus by grace through faith, but then we start striving. <laughs> it's like we're okay with the idea that our initial salvation, there's nothing we could do to earn it. But then once we've got it, we think that we have to prove ourselves so we can be loved by God, so we can be worthy to be used by God. So we, you know, and we think it's all about our merit. And no, the whole thing, the entire Christian life is by grace through faith. And it doesn't matter if what you're wanting to do is, is uh, you know, to love your neighbor more. By grace through faith. Healing ministry, by grace through faith. Uh, gosh, raise money for an orphanage, by grace through faith. 
It's all about serving him. And here I am looking at these verses, and it just challenges me like there's something available in Christ that I I don't want to miss. In fact, if you go over to Hebrews 4, I love this. Verse 1 says, Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. I wrote in the margin of my Bible here, May I not fall short of rest. May I not fall short of rest. When you start reading this passage, you get down to verses uh, below, like um, uh, verse 3 that says, Now we who believe enter that rest, just as God has said. So I declared an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. There's this, this idea that this rest is happening now. This is not for after you die. It's a rest that starts here. Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they would know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. Eternal life isn't something that you wait for until after you die. (laughs) Eternal life starts here. Ephesians 2.6 says, not only have I died with Christ, but I've been raised up with him to new life and seated with Christ in the heavenly realms in him. I mean, that's, whoa, whoa. People ask me, how do you know you're going to heaven? I'm like, because I'm already there. Seriously. Do you realize the magnitude of what he's made available to you? And and if we can just rest in that and let him live through us, as we've been talking about all week, or all weekend, I should say, I'm telling you, Jesus starts to be seen in and through you, all around you. People start encountering him through you. I want to live in such a way that an encounter with me is an encounter with Jesus. And that's possible if I no longer live, but Christ lives in me, as Galatians 2.20 says it. Come on. Hebrews 4, I want to dig a little deeper into this Hebrews 4 passage, because there's a lot here that's uh, really valuable for us to learn. But in order to set the stage for it, I want us to back up to chapter 3, starting in verse 7. So as the Holy Spirit says, now this, this is a quote from the Old Testament. If I remember correctly, I believe it's from the Psalms. Uh, But at any rate, it's a quote from the Old Testament. It says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. That's why I was angry with that generation. I said their hearts are always going astray and they've not known my ways. So I declared an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. Now, the rest that's, list, that's described here is not the post-death heaven rest, but the presently transformed by the Holy Spirit through faith in Jesus kind of rest. Like they didn't get to enter the promised land on earth. That was not God saying they'll never get to be in heaven. I mean, Moses, think about Moses. This is a guy, one time, everybody's thirsty. God says, Moses, uh, sp- uh, strike that rock and I'll make water come out. And boom, <laughs> God gives water to all the, of, of the Israelites. Later in his life, there's the, uh, people are thirsty, and God says, hey, Mo, speak to the rock. And this time, Moses is like, yeah, but last time I struck it. Poof. Guess what happened? Water still came out of the rock. See, there's times when I think I've got to do everything right and make sure all the, you know, the, I jump through the right hoops and the stars are aligned and, you know, that that's the way a miracle will happen. No. Moses did it wrong, disobeyed God in how he did it, but God still did the miracle because of his love for the people. So don't sit there and self-analyze and think I got to do this perfect or God's not going to take care of them. It's I want to do this well because... I want to please my father. I want to do what he's telling me to do and do it the way he wants me to do it. But that's between me and him. That's not about whether or not the miracle happens. And so I'm sitting here watching this, and Moses gets, the miracle still happens, but Moses gets disciplined big time. Moses doesn't get to enter the promised land. And a lot of people think of that as like, man, that's a pretty steep consequence for hitting a rock with a stick. (laughs) but I want you to catch something. That had nothing to do with his eternal destiny because what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration? Jesus is there flashing like lightning and Elijah and Moses show up to talk to him. Apparently Moses made it in the end. 
the eternal rest he got to have, but the temporary, the earthly, the earthly experience of rest, he never got to experience. Neither did the rest of that generation. Why? Why? It says right down here, if you skip down to verse 16, who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not those, all those who Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was God angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. What? All this stuff here, I see they rebelled, they sinned, they disobeyed, but the explanation in Hebrews was that was just the fruit of the fact that they didn't believe. Now, we talked a little bit about this on Thursday, but for those who weren't here, the basic gist is Romans 14, 23 says anything that does not come from faith is sin. I was down in Brazil uh, a couple years ago. I don't know if I told you this story last year, but... Uh, there was basically, um, long story short, a, a whole bunch of people who had eye conditions that were blind. And listen, I, I lay hands on lots of people for healing, and I do not have 100% results. I just, I know Jesus does, but I'm still learning to be like him. <laughs> and so I give it my best shot. But this time, for whatever reason, God just did something in this meeting where everybody with eye problems that I laid hands on got healed. And I was just like, this is crazy. And there was one woman who was led up by the hand, and, and she had like, uh, like com she was completely blind, born blind. And I asked her, what can you see? Like, does that mean everything is just, just like black, just one color? Or is it like you can see light or colors or shapes? And she goes, I can tell if the lights are on or off, but I can't see anything else. I said, okay. So I held her hand, and uh, I said, uh, is there any change? And she looks and she says, no. I put my hands on her eyes. I said, open up right now in Jesus' name. Is there any change? She goes, I think I see the outline of you. I did it again. She goes, I can see your face. I go, look around. How far can you see? And she pointed about as far away as Alan is here. And, and she's like, I can see that man over there in the, in the shirt. And, um, and uh, I said, okay, I did it again. And she goes, oh, I can see back there. The, the sanctuary of this church was probably four times the length of this room. And uh, there was a door in the back that opened up onto the street. And so she looked back about where the video booth is and pointed out some people there. She said, one, two, three, I see the people there. I can read the, I can see the letters on that man's shirt. I said, I did it one more time. She goes, I see the cars going by outside the doors. Ah! My translator was wetting her pants. I mean, she did not know how to process. She had never seen anything like this. And so this translator, after everything she witnessed that day, she goes to her boyfriend, who's not a believer, and she, she's like, you have to come to the meeting tonight. No arguing. You will be there. So he comes to the meeting. He sits in the back row the whole time. There's people getting healed, people getting saved. I preached a good gospel message that day. And at the end, he didn't raise his hand. <laughs> but my translator's like, listen, he didn't raise his hand, but I am taking you to meet him. And she like grabs my arm and walks me back to the back of the church. And I sat down, greeted him. We sat and chatted for a while. I asked him about his life, what he does. And, and I said, hey, has anybody ever, um, I said, you know, after hearing what you heard tonight and saw what you saw tonight, is there like any reason you don't want to follow Jesus? And he goes, well, honestly, I'm a good person. Like, I, I give to charity. I'm, I'm not, like, evil in any way. I'm, I'm taking care of people. I'm raising my brother. I'm doing, I'm doing all these wonderful things. And he goes, you know, I, I, I don't need that. I don't need to be changed. Like, I'm, I'm living a good life. I'm comfortable. I'm happy. I said, let me, let me maybe explain this to you a different way. There's two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. And... Uh, the king of this kingdom over here, well, first of all, the kingdom of light is everything, joy, peace, love, just everything awesome that it should be, everything perfect. Kingdom of darkness is chaos and destruction and death and all of that stuff. Now, the king of this kingdom, his name is Jesus. And the only thing you've got to do to be in this kingdom is to completely surrender to that king and say that whatever he says, that's what matters. And not only that, but 
What he says is, I want you in such a close relationship with me that when people see you, they see me. That an encounter with you is an encounter with me. That we're going to walk in union together. And we're going to do things together. But the only thing you have to do to be in this kingdom is your own thing. Just be independent. You can be in union with Jesus, or you can be independent. And when you're independent, guess what? You can be as good of a person as you want. But Romans 14.23 says anything that doesn't come from faith, that relational trust, is sin. Isaiah says that all our righteousness is like filthy rags. I'm like, you can do this all in your own strength. And you can strive and you can try to be as good of a person as you can be. And it will never be union with Jesus. Now, I wish I could tell you that he gave his life to Jesus that day. But he just said, I want to think about that for a while. But you've given me a new outlook. I never heard from him after that. But that's sort of a, 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 a way of thinking. I feel like it's a better gospel presentation, honestly. Because I think what I grew up with was, here's all the bad things people do, and if you want to be free from it, come on in. Which is true. But we neglect the ones who, they're like, I got my life together. I'm not doing bad stuff. No, they need this gospel too. And really, if we get right down to it, if you want to start splitting hairs, they are transgressing the law of God. And I'm sure they have at some point. But that's... Jesus came to set us free from all that. He came to set us free from us. Set us free from independence. And bring us into the, the kingdom of the son of his love. My goodness. So here's what it says. They rebelled, they sinned, they disobeyed, but it was because of their unbelief. As soon as you put your trust in Jesus, guess what? He starts living his life through you. Now we're into chapter 4. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us, just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Now, see, you see how obedience is connected with faith? When you trust Jesus, he lives his life through you. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey what I command. Like, love comes first, and obedience is normal. My parents, they lived on opposite sides of the state of Michigan when they were dating. And um, one time, my, my mom baked muffins, and she mailed them U.S. mail to my dad. This was back in, like, the 50s. Mailed them U.S. mail over to my dad, and they get there, you know, after a while. And when they arrived to my dad, they were no longer blueberry muffins. They were blueberry rocks. But my dad, because he loved her, ate every single one. Yes. You do crazy things for love. I'm telling you. If you're having a hard time obeying Jesus, the problem isn't that you're tr not trying hard enough. Maybe it's just you need to love him and trust him. And, and how do you love him? The Bible says we love because Christ first loved us. So if you let him love you, you will start to fall deeper in love with him. And the obedience becomes natural and easy and fun. My goodness. And it continues here. Now we who have believed enter that rest. Just as God has said, so I declared an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world. Think about this. There's a couple, there's like this weird juxtaposition in the scripture. In one place, right here, it says that God's works have been finished since the creation of the world. But there's this moment where Jesus does a miracle or something on the Sabbath, and everybody's on his case about it, and he's like, listen, this is John 5. He goes, the son only does what he sees his father doing, right? Whatever the father does, the son also does. And he goes, my father is always at work, so I'm always at work. It's the basic paraphrase. <laughs> wait a minute, he ceased working all the way back at creation, but now he's always at work? Which one is it? The answer is yes. See, everything God does as work comes from a place of rest. In fact, uh, I, I understand that, uh, that uh, there's, there's um, the literal interpretation of the Bible, and then there's also this kind of poetic side where we see metaphors and beautiful poetry woven throughout. And so... 
I, I'm not trying to discount any literal interpretation that, that we might have about the days of creation. But the Hebrew rabbis looked at the days of creation and they said, on every one of the days it says there was evening and there was morning on the first day, the second day, the third day. But on the seventh day when God rested, it doesn't say there was evening and there was morning. And so the Hebrew rabbis would teach that that meant God's rest there is actually an eternal rest, not a 24 hours rest, but an eternal rest that goes well beyond the beginning and the end. And so they say that all the creation God did, from let there be light to breathing into man, all of that creation was coming from a place of rest. And I'm like, you know what? That holds up. Because how hard is it for God to go, let there be light? Right? I mean, even if they're wrong in their interpretation, they're right in their conclusion. <laughs> how simple is that? For the God of the universe, the creator, to just be like, mm, let's do this. Let's make a new creation. Let's take this person whose life is an absolute mess and transform it. How hard is that? Everything God does comes from a place of rest. And Jesus says, I only do what I see my father doing. And so Jesus, even when he was working, he was doing it from a place of rest. Paul wrote to the Colossians, to, talking about the gospel ministry. He goes, to this end I labor, striving with all his energy, which so powerfully works through me. Ah. <sighs> It's not about you trying hard enough. There was this time I was in a sermon. I was listening to a sermon. I wasn't preaching it. I wasn't in the sermon either. But I was listening to this sermon. And the, uh, the preacher said, uh, this guy came to me and he said, Pastor, I've got this addiction. And, and you know we've been dealing with this, this addiction for six months. And I just, I can't break it. And the pastor's response, he goes, and you know what I told him? Stop it. And it took everything inside of me to stay in my seat because I wanted to stand up and be like, that's a false gospel. If stop it worked, then we didn't need Jesus to come. The law says stop it. And it never worked. But it wasn't my church and it wasn't my service, so I uh, <laughs> stayed in my chair. And I talked to that preacher later. I went and visited his office later in the week. And I was very humble and gentle and kind and he still didn't receive it, but. <laughs> but I'm telling you, I mean, you ever see the old, any of you ever see the old Bob Newhart comedy sketch where the, the stop it doctor? <laughs> yeah, stop it or I'll bury you alive in a box. Some of you get the joke. So it's not how God is. Look it up on YouTube if you're wondering. All right, not right now. I got to bring this home. All right. Verse, uh, let's go down to verse eight. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would, meaning when he led them into the promised land, if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Notice all throughout here, like back in verse 3, it says, at the end of it, it says, my rest. Uh, end of verse 5, my rest. Right here in verse 10, God's rest. It's not even about you resting your way. It's about being so unified with Jesus that God's rest becomes your rest. I don't get it. I'm preaching it, but I don't get it. I'm trying to experience it, and I think I, I, think I found it. I just don't know exactly how to put words to it. Just being honest. But when you get to this place with Jesus where you're like, I don't even really have to try to rest. It's like, I just want to be one with him. And as I spend time in intimacy with Jesus, getting to know him, beholding him, letting him reveal himself to me, 2 Corinthians uh, five, or 3 says that as we behold his glory, we are transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. Little by little, one degree of revealing him to the next. And guess what happens? I start to rest naturally from trying to prove myself, trying to be good enough, trying to you know, make myself presentable to God and all of that. And I realize Jesus has already done everything. I just get to, wow. And so it says here, finishes up this argumentation here. Ooh, the wind turned my page. 
chapter 4, verse 11, it says, Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. The only effort you're allowed to make is the effort to enter the rest. So that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. Make every effort to enter that rest. What does that look like? It looks like spending time with the one who wants to be one with you so that he can produce the rest in you. My son, uh, my oldest, he was going, I mean, he, he's, he's just gone through some rough stuff just to, emotionally. Like he's, he was born uh, five and a half weeks premature with the all tangled up in his umbilical cord and had some oxygen deprivation. And so there's been some moments where, you know, he just couldn't control his emotions. And we just talked to him about, yeah, buddy, you got big emotions, man. And it's, it's, a, it's something that you just got to deal with. And, and Jesus is going to teach you how to, how to manage that. And it's not okay to scream and break things when you're three years old. Or when you're one and a half and you, you know, you've done something wrong and you start banging your head on the floor. Like, that's not normal behavior. I mean, it, this kid was going through some stuff and we're like, are we bad parents? What have we done? Right? He's doing awesome today. He's, almost, he's uh, eight and a half right now. I mean... God's done some big stuff. But here we were about, let's see, this would have been about three years ago. And he was throwing this wild, crazy fit. And it had been going on for about two hours. And I was like, I had been sitting there calmly with him the whole time and trying to just help him collect himself again. And it just was not happening. And I like, honestly, I just couldn't take it anymore. I got up, I walked out of the room, closed the door, and I was like, whatever happens in there happens. And I went and laid on my face in the other room, and I said, Jesus, I don't know what to do. Like, I have a degree in early childhood development and education. I worked in the child care industry for like nine years. I've got all this experience. I took classes on special needs and all this stuff, and I should have all the answers right now. I was like, I got nothing, God. I've tried everything that I've been taught. I need to somehow convey to my son the gospel because that's the only thing that's going to set him free. I mean, I can love him and that's going to help him cope, but the gospel is the only thing that will set him free. And all of a sudden, this, this picture came to my mind and then, then words started coming. And I grabbed my notebook and I started writing down this little poem. And um, this year we got to turn it into a kid's book. But I want to read this to you today as we close to kind of help you understand this idea of letting Jesus live through you. This is called, Who's Driving Your Car? Yeah, love it. All right, let's go to that first page. Imagine there's a little car that's way down deep inside of you. Whoever holds the steering wheel determines what you do. This car is very special and can take you many places, but you have to pick a driver who can help you win life's races. You're the one who makes the choice about who drives your car, so you're the one responsible for whether it goes far. I want to tell you now about the drivers you can choose. It's the only way to set your life so that you win, not lose. First are your emotions, or the way you're right now feeling, like when you feel so happy that you want to climb the ceiling. Or maybe you feel angry and want to throw your toys. Or maybe you are sad or fearful of a noise. Quack, quack. Emotions have long legs and can reach the pedals fine, but they can't see out the window because they're well below the line. They're crazy little drivers who do not watch where they're going, and they'll steer your car to dangerous places without you even knowing. If you let the emotions drive your car, they'll make your life go fast. But since they can't see where you are, they certainly will crash. You're the one who chooses if emotions get to drive, so keep them from the driver's seat, for goodness sakes alive. Next, we have your brain. It's the part of you that thinks. Sometimes it has such great ideas, but sometimes it just stinks. You see, your brain is limited to what it understands. So if you don't know something, then it doesn't have a chance. A lot of times, your brain can drive and not have any struggle. Your brain can think and reason when it has ideas to juggle. But your brain can get distracted or not know where it's going. It can lead your car to danger zones without you even knowing. If your brain is in the driver's seat, you may feel in control, 
But that pride can be deceiving and may lead you to a hole. It tries to be so smart and to lead the right direction, but it never will be perfect. No, your brain can't reach perfection. The third potential driver is made up of your desires. It's the part of you that thinks ahead about what life requires. When desires drive your car, sometimes things work out great. Sometimes you reach the target at a fast, amazing rate. But desires aren't all good, and they may lead scary places. Sometimes they can be selfish and ignore your friends' sad faces. Some things are not worth having. Some things are not worth doing. If things you want could hurt someone, those things aren't worth pursuing. There's nothing wrong with setting goals and choosing to attain them, but do not let desires drive your life. Instead, restrain them. Desires have great vision and can see things really far, but they often don't see things up close, like dangers to your car. Last, I want to tell you of the only perfect driver. If he's behind the wheel, you will sure be a survivor. His legs can reach the pedals and his eyes can see real far. He's smart and kind and perfect. He's the best to drive your car. This driver's name is Jesus. He's God's one and only son. No one else can drive your car as safely or as fun. He knows the best life for you, so be sure to let him in. When you choose to let him drive your life, I guarantee you'll win. When emotions drive your car, they can't see where you're going. But Jesus knows everything, even dangers that aren't showing. When your brain is in the driver's seat, it sometimes can get lost. But Jesus always wins when you let him be the boss. Jesus can do more than drive your car and steer its tires. He also guides your feelings and your brain and your desires. He changes your emotions and can give you great ideas. He fills your life with goodness so that you can be like he is. Emotions become safe when you let Jesus steer the wheel. And your brain can be quite useful when it understands God's real. And Jesus knows exactly which desires will be best, so he'll steer you to the best ones and avoid all of the rest. So every day, just ask yourself, who is driving my car? Jesus is way better than the other drivers are. If you want things really bad or you're feeling kind of blue, just entrust your life to Jesus because you know that he loves you. Come on. <laughs> Today there's an invitation to know the one who's not interested in turning you into some kind of drone who works and works and works for him, but instead turning you into someone who is so free from you and so in union with him that work is restful, that all the things he prepared in advance for you to do, all the good works, all the ideas, whether it be an orphanage in Uganda or whether it be just you know, ministering love to the coworker across the aisle, or whether it be sharing Jesus with a friend at school or whatever. Whatever it is he's called you to, I'm telling you, you can do it from a place of rest. Now, some of you have never given your life to Jesus, but he, he's inviting you into this. It's not a place of, when, when we say rest here, we're not talking about, all right, I'm going to kick back and relax, and then heaven's just going to be plucking a harp for eternity. No. We've got all kinds of wonderful stuff to do for the rest of eternity. Jesus talked about giving people cities. I don't even know how that works. But I'll tell you what. God wants to do something here for you today where he sets you free from you and brings you into that union with him. The same Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead comes to live in you and he makes you a new creation. Alan, you want to play some guitar here for us? If you've never given your life to Jesus, today's your day. Now, in a moment, for the rest of us, I have something I want to pray through with you too, but, but right now I want to focus on this. If you've never given your life to Jesus, today's the day you can be transformed. And God will put his spirit in you. You'll become a new creation. In fact, if you're really daring today, we can even baptize you right here, right now. I mean, we'll get this job started. Come on. But at any rate... I just want to pray with you. And you can stay where you are. I'll stay here. I'm just going to pray for you. And I believe that that transformation is going to trigger right here, right now. And you're going to start to become more and more like Jesus, not through your striving, but through your intimacy with him, your closeness with him, the time you spend with him, talking to him, listening for his voice, reading his word, spending time with other believers. It's going to change everything. Following Jesus is better than anything else in the world. It's what you were created for. And you can't be truly you 
apart from being who you were created to be. So there's an invitation to you today. And if you want to surrender your life to Jesus today, you want me to pray for you, I want to do it right now. Would you just raise your hand so I can pray for you? Awesome. Anybody else? Thank you, Lord. Anybody else? Jesus, you're good. Father, I thank you for this woman who responded to the gospel. You're so good. Jesus, you said no one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. And I know that you've drawn her to Jesus today. And I speak a blessing over her life that from this day forward, may she never be the same in Jesus' name. And I proclaim to you, you are forgiven in the name of Jesus. Receive the Holy Spirit right now. Be free in Jesus' name. Lord, for every one of us here, maybe we came to you by grace through faith, but we haven't continued to live in that place of rest. Maybe we've been striving to prove ourselves to you, trying to be good enough to qualify for whatever it is we think we're supposed to do, but Jesus, today you're saying, it's not about you qualifying, it's about me qualifying and you being in union with me. <laughs> So Jesus, all of us, we're sorry for our independence. We're sorry for the times we wrestle that steering wheel out of your hands and try to drive our own car. And Lord, I, I pray that we would just not only relinquish that steering wheel, not only just, not even just sit in the back seat. Lord, would you lock us in the trunk <laughs> like the dead body we're supposed to be and just let you run this thing. Jesus, we want no earthly circumstance to have more authority over our emotions than the Holy Spirit. <laughs> we want no desire to lead our lives more than the desire to know you and be one with you, to accomplish your will in the earth, to love people with your love. Lord, sanctify, set apart our minds for your purpose. That everything from our creativity to our strategizing to all of it, I pray that it would just be something that is in partnership with you, that we would, as Scripture says, that we would have the mind of Christ. That there would be God thoughts that come to us that we would invest our creative energies in things that, that lift others up and bring glory to you and not waste them on things of this world that just don't matter. Jesus, we want to be one with you. Lord, teach us to rest. Teach us to work from a place of rest. Teach us to love you and serve you from a place of rest where it's not about us being good enough or strong enough or fast enough or smart enough or anything like that, but just it's about you being enough for us. Jesus, would you love the world through us? Would you change the world through us? Would you impact our families through us, our spouses, our children through us? Would you bring revival in our churches through us, in our homes through us, in our neighborhoods through us? Lord, we want whatever you want, and we want to do it however you want to do it. Thank you for making it so simple. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.